all the thoughts that I've had since Raul introduced this uh, seem to complement what I've been listening to this, this evening. And uh, I know there's a great temptation uh, for us to want to stop and, uh, and expand. And I hope that's exactly what we're going to do in future. I'd like to uh, touch on what I could consider a complementary dimension of this, or maybe the better way to say it is the macrocosm. Uh, the, the work on networks starts at a very specific level of when we see how an individual separate network operates. But uh, I'm interested in the concept that the whole of society could be looked at as a single integrated complex network. And in the short time available, I just want to touch on some of the topics that I think we beneficially explore in the academy that are already uh, quite closely related to some of the things we're already doing, not under the heading of network science, but where the bringing network science could help us to gain some perspectives and maybe do some original thinking on it. Uh, and come to uh, practical areas where I think there are uh, applications that we might explore. I'd like to start uh, very generally at the macro level uh, with a statement actually inspired by Sri Aurobindo, Indian philosopher, that the progress of society can be looked at as a progress, a process of increasing consciousness. And the evolution of that consciousness depends on and expresses itself through an increasingly complex and rich and effective organization. Uh, we can apply that biologically to the development of the, uh, the nervous system and the brain. We can also apply it socially. And that, uh, in that case, if Raul's comment that we are moving from a hierarchical to a networking society, it would reflect also on uh, a changing and an evolving consciousness of humanity. Uh, if we look at society as a whole, as a network, uh, just to paint uh, a, a very simple uh, mental picture, if you imagine some uh, five or 20,000 years ago before or after, the, uh, let's say 5,000 years ago after the establishment of agriculture, uh, we could imagine uh, figuratively that the world consisted of a number of small clusters of humanity uh, organized around uh, a communal life uh, with very few interactions with other clusters, uh, in somewhat intense interactions among themselves and small groups. Maybe it's a village structure, uh, but very little interaction between the groups, one because transportation and communication was so difficult that language was impossible, and very often we, uh, we perceive uh, those who were not part of our small group as enemies and threats uh, to that group. If we jump ahead a few thousand years uh, after uh, the development of uh, commerce and primitive transportation and roads, we can imagine that many of these small clusters found there is an advantage in relating to one another, since it's very difficult both mathematically and practically for all uh, individual clusters to relate to one another uh, uh, directly, uh, it would make sense to set up some central place where all the clusters coordinated their linkages. And then you have the birth of uh, simple rural towns where market fairs are there. Everybody comes to the town to bring what they have to sell and to buy what they cannot produce locally. And we get a second level of organization of the global society, very much in isolated clusters and then regionally defined clusters. And at some time, a few thousand years later, we can imagine that these towns, some of them have grown into uh, large, especially those that are on rivers or on uh, the sea, have grown into larger establishments and become a focal point for the linkage of 
many of the other clusters of towns. And then at a further stage, uh, it becomes international. The, the contacts become uh, transcontinental and, uh, and international. And if we look at that, we've seen the maps of the internet communication that we have today, which really makes the whole of society look like a very rich, complex web. Uh, but if we can imagine back that this fabric was relatively thin and sparse and poorly connected in the past. Now, that applies not only to uh, physical connections, it applies to commercial connections, it applies to uh, exchanges of activity, it applies to the uh, communications and uh, uh, exchange of ideas as well. If that's the case, then it might be if we look at the whole society as an evolving network, that the principle we see operative in Moore's law uh, about exponential growth has really been going on for a very long time, from a very, very sparse beginning, uh, and now gaining momentum at the social level, looking at the society as a microprocess or a macroprocess, where there's an increase in speed, visibility, number of transactions, and increasing layers of complexity that are interacting with one another. So the concept, and I'm going to come to why I think this could be a helpful concept for us, uh, the concept of society as a whole as a network that relates to the movement of material things, interactions between individuals and groups, relationships between activity, linkages between organizations, dissemination of information, knowledge, ideas, and, and so forth. And I'm sure I've skipped a transmission of skills and technologies and uh, many other things could be added to the list. And if we look at these all as aspects of a single multi-dimensional network, which is the human organ, the human social organism, which covers so many of the functions uh, and many others uh, than what I've listed here. And we see there are certain characteristics in the growing uh, complexity of human society. Uh, uh, I've taken for example of this three, and I'm just going to touch on them very briefly. In fact, uh, Ivo and I have written an article for the present issue of Cadmus, the electronic version just came out on money, uh, where we did a brief comparison of the relationship between language, money, and the internet, which I'm not, I'm only going to touch on it, allude to it here. Language, these are really all, uh, they can be each of them thought as a networking, as a network or as a networking tool. Uh, as we can imagine that human communication and networking at the communication level would be very impossible, very difficult and limited without language. It's also true that at the level of exchange, of specialization, uh, of commerce, that our interactions with one another would be extremely limited if we hadn't invented a mechanism such as money uh, to facilitate those interactions in space and time. Uh, before money, we were relying on barter transactions. Barter requires what they call the double coincidence. You, somebody who has a need uh, has to find somebody else who has not only the capacity to fill it, but also wants something that the, uh, the person with the need has uh, in order for an exchange. The introduction of money makes it possible for somebody to sell whatever they have of value to somebody else, if it's of value potentially, to anyone else within the network. And therefore, we increase the velocity, the volume, and the complexity of interactions exponentially, which has been happening, of course, for centuries. Money makes it possible to move from the local to the global level, and it makes it possible for transactions to move from the here and now uh, into the distant future. Obviously, what we see from money in commerce 
and in language for communication is much more true of the internet, which is a multi-dimensional networking device that links communication, language, uh, uh, commerce, uh, education, science, and all, virtually all types of activity in a way that is increasingly integrated. And I'll come back uh, to that in a minute. Uh, but to understand the network effect of money, we need to also look at another, another aspect of the social network, or if you want to call it a separate network, but I'm calling them aspects of a single whole, and that's the market. Uh, in my this mental painting of the evolution of society, very simplistic, we saw at the first step, market is really confined to immediate neighbors who have something or need something uh, available locally. When you get the rural town, you suddenly uh, get the possibility of exchanges through many clusters over a wider area and exchanges of a much wider variety of products. And then the town itself starts producing other types of goods, manufactured goods and services that are not available, education, medical care, and so forth, that are not available uh, at the local level. When you take the networking of money and the network of market, and you link them together, you get a system that's capable of exponential expansion as we see where it has gone today. Uh, banking is a subset of this larger social system, specifically relating to the utilization of money. Uh, we Somebody generates it and acquires a surplus, and banking makes it possible to efficiently make that surplus available to others who have a need for it. And so it's another aspect of this integrated network. Then you can go to a deeper level and say that credit card, which is linked to banking, linked to markets, and linked to uh, money, uh, is a way to give a further dimension of complexity, productivity, and power to the overall effectiveness of the society. It's very different. You can't talk about the credit card as independent from the market or the bank or the money. It's another aspect of an integrated network. So there are some characteristics of networks which uh, uh, Raul alluded to some of them, and I think it's a topic that would be worth, uh, I'm not going to go into it now, but I think in what ways does a network resemble other forms of social organization, and what are the factors that really distinguish it would be important uh, as, as part of our larger investigations. Uh, and then one of the real Significant defining characteristics, I think, of the network is integration. Of all the types of social organization that we know, the network is the most highly integrated. Raul, just a few minutes ago, alluded to the increasing complexity of society and whether we're going to be able to stop it. Uh, I think, on the contrary, uh, the whole process of social development and social evolution uh, is going to grow to higher and higher levels of complexity and greater and greater levels of integration. Now, if we look back in a long time frame, we might say that the more levels of integration have taken place in the society, both in terms of uh, geographic linkages and hierarchical or interactions between different activities. I put in a list before of about eight or nine different activities. Uh, just, uh, now, all of these activities are more and more integrated with one another, and not just integrated among themselves, but more and more integrated with one another than they have ever been in the past. Each time we get a, a, a simple example would be air transport. Uh, the air transport system works as effectively as it does because it's so closely linked with the communication system. 
and the credit card system uh, for easy payment, and uh, many other things as well. But just to uh, uh, just to illustrate, now if this process of increasing complexity and integration can be related to the growing capacity of society. One of the things we see over the last centuries is the capacity of society to accomplish its goals, whether it's to produce food or to sustain a larger population or to give medical care, promote public health, education, democracy, uh, whatever uh, entertainment, whatever those goals may be, we see the capacity of the society increasingly capable of doing that with some obvious serious limitations and problems that have come up in the way. Uh, if, if that can be related to the extent of the integration of the global society as a whole, and I think it can, then it would be interesting for us to approach the problems that we face today and look at them as terms of gaps in the integration and gaps in the, uh, uh, the development of the social fabric as a global system. Uh, and uh, so I'd just like to end with a few implications and possible applications. Uh, my thought is that the potential for improving the performance of human networks is really immense. And I'm just going to suggest a few examples of that. But in a sense, we're still at an early stage in the coordination and integration of human interactions for optimal advantage and advancement. One obvious example is uh, Wikipedia, which is only about 10, maybe 14 years old now, uh, what's the difference between the hierarchical system where all knowledge is concentrated uh, at a point, at a center, among a few, uh, Britannica has a couple of thousand editors, of course they draw on a larger number, but it's a, a, a unidirectional process very much, uh, to a Wikipedia, a networking approach where virtually every user has the potential to also be a contributor. Uh, to the global knowledge. I'm only using it as an example. I think in most areas of society today, we are at the Britannica stage, if, it, if we even have a Britannica, and there's uh, a, a great deal further we can go to enhance social productivity. One indication of this ties into the work we have been doing on the global employment challenge and we've constantly been making the case that we have a situation today where there are vast human resources that are underutilized. Human capital is a perishable resource. If our skills and capacities are not utilized, they, they not only tend to decline after time, but if we are not utilized as an individual and made productive, our, psycho our psychology also tends to decline over time, uh, and we become uh, less and less capable of uh, expressing our potential. So we have a situation today where we have a very rich human capacity, and increasingly we have an incapacity of our economic system as it's presently designed to utilize fully that human capital. One dimension of this is the youth who are entering the workforce, and we're all familiar with the high levels of uh, unemployment at, at, among the young. But equally valid would be a utilization of the vast knowledge and skills of the elderly who are forced out or uh, don't find a way to fully engage themselves once they reach retirement age. If we look at society as itself a network, then we would say there must be uh, much more we could do to fully utilize and tap the human resource for the welfare, uh, for productive purposes, uh, for psychological fulfillment, for social recognition. I'm only giving it as 
one example at the macro level. There are many others. We see now uh, many efforts underway to rethink education. We participated and were co-sponsoring a conference on education at the International University Center at the Brooklyn last month. Uh, a simple calculation illustrates this. If India, where I'm based, tries, wants to raise the level of education up to the level, higher education up to the level it is in the U.S., according to the current methods of education, India would have to create another 100,000 colleges. Now, if you extend that over China and all the other developing countries, uh, uh, we'd be talking about maybe a half a million colleges, let alone how many trained teachers we'd need. And clearly, uh, both the cost and the efficacy of doing that would be severely limited. If we approach the issue of global education at all levels from the perspective of networking, and look at how effectively we are utilizing the knowledge, the technology, the information systems to meet the needs of humanity. I think it's obvious that, uh, as Raul indicated in his opening remarks, uh, uh, or perhaps it was big uh, in his comments on uh, organizational structure, we're still stuck very much in the past and only at the early stage of evolving more effective, integrated, complex systems. Uh, I would suggest uh, the same thing is true uh, in dealing with the financial crisis and uh, uh, the generation of wealth, a big topic. Uh, and the same thing is also true in the field of cooperative security. One of our very active fellows, Jagjit Singh, has been arguing for a long time that if you really wanted to organize global security in an optimal way, you would do it in a, in a very different way than it's done now at the national level. The national level system is a competitive system. The security of each nation, at least apparently, seems to depend on its capacity to be stronger and better armed than everybody else around it. And by definition, the more secure one country feels, the more insecure everybody else feels. Uh, a cooperative system as a whole would, on the other hand, look at the problem of security as a whole and see how global resources could be allocated. And by one calculation, probably with 10% of the global military spending, which is now about 1.6 trillion, uh, we could effectively ensure uh, the security against military threats uh, for all countries. Of course, we're a long way politically and socially uh, from that, but I think it illustrates uh, the scope of thinking of uh, uh, the global society as a whole in terms of networks.